We're going to start off with a little bit of research. Okay, this is a scientific forum. Um, we're all about scientific research. So we're going to do a really quick survey to get everybody into the mood. All you're going to have to do is put your hand up at the appropriate time. Did everyone do that? Cool, all right, we're set. Quick survey, four questions. Um, so we're going to have a look at um, what constitutes, what kind of evidence, what kind of data actually constitutes um, you know, a paranormal experience or evidence for um, paranormal experience. So I don't know if you can see this clearly, it is a little bit washed out. Um, we're looking at this area here. Um, so quick show of hands, no right or wrong questions. Who thinks that this would be data that supports the existence of life after death? Quick show of hands. Couple, cool, good. We're going to flick through these quickly. Um, this one's a little bit harder to see. Uh, this man is a dentist, that's why you can't see his face. Um, we're looking at this area here. Anyone think that this would support? Yep, cool, you people. Again, no right or wrong answers. Um, anyone for this? So we're looking at a data set here. Um, and this across the, the top, if you're not uh, familiar with it, is known as a, a t-test. Any takers? A couple of people? Yep, good. Final one. <laughs> Any takers? Few? Good, perfect. Perfect. Why is that all the best evidence is always grainy and shaky and, and somewhat out of focus? Um, if you haven't realized, usually uh, any talk like this, you know, there has to be the introductory joke, so we've ticked that off, we can now move along. Um, before I start this presentation formally, um, an apology. I really suck at naming things, um, and I'm really going to feel sorry for my kids. Um, I kind of went, yeah, the talk's going to be about this. Um, and then I started putting together my talk in, in a bit more detail. I went, actually, this title sucks. Um, we are still going to cover this, so don't worry about that. I haven't got you in here on false pretenses. Um, I actually find the word ghost to be a bit of a misnomer, particularly in, in parapsychology. Um, but we're stuck with that title. We're going to run with it. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, so as, as Vlad said, um, my background is actually in education, but with that came uh, a lot of work in research. Uh, therefore, I've been able to apply that to, to what I'm currently doing in, in parapsychology as well. Um, I'm also studying psychology, um, so a lot of what Tony was talking about earlier, I'm there going, yeah, that makes great sense. Uh, and a lot of what Tony was talking about too uh, will actually come into this talk um, when we get into um, hallucinatory experiences as well. Um, so all that background has already been covered for me, which is fantastic. Um, so a little bit more. Um, so I, a few years ago, um, had a, uh, everyone starts off like this, I had a paranormal experience. Um, but from that, started to, to want to get a little bit more serious about parapsychology, um, formally researched that, documented it, and then had it published. Um, and then since then I've sort of been helping out the Australian Institute of Parapsychological Research um, with some peer reviews and, and stuff like that. And now I'm here. Um, what I'm going to cover today is basically my research. Um, I've tried to make it as accessible as possible to everyone. If you do want more depth and, and more nitty gritty about it, um, check out the journal. Um, it has a lot more information about um, the data, the surveys, the survey questions are in there. Um, and so on and so forth. Um, being that this is um, a real case of a poltergeist that um, I have investigated, there is a lot of privacy concerns. So things like the location, the people involved, even some of the details around the people, um, I can't actually put up here today. Um, even though we're not mentioning names or anything like that, there is still that privacy and that respect issue um, which we would like to acknowledge. So I'll go through the research, um, look at the, the methodology of how that actually happened, um, and then talk about how we can actually start furthering this field. So before we get into a little bit more detail about my, my research, I wanted to start off with some theories of what a poltergeist is actually about. 
Um, so has everyone heard of the noisy spirit? This is really what the word poltergeist actually means in, in German. Um, so this theory is that a poltergeist is an external entity, a ghost, if you will, um, and it's being disruptive. That's where the noisy part comes from. It's throwing the books around the room, it's rapping on the walls, um, it's tossing people out of bed, it's making a, a, a lot of disturbance. So, noisy spirit. Um, probably the second most popular theory is RSPK, which stands for Recurrent Spontaneous Psychokinesis. So to break this down a little bit further for people, um, let's start with spontaneous. It's happening randomly. The person doing this has no control over it. With psychokinesis, if you think about mind over matter, trying to move an object with your mind, uh, when people tend to do this in a uh, laboratory setup, they're sitting there, they're staring at the object, trying to make it move. With RSPK, though, it's completely spontaneous. If I was able to manifest RSPK, I could be talking right now, and suddenly cups start flying around the room. I didn't try to do it, I didn't want to do it, it was spontaneous. Um, the recurrent part, it's happening over and over and over again. Not something I just did once or twice, it's something that's happening multiple times. Um, and then obviously the psychokinesis, as I mentioned, moving objects um, with the power of your mind. So with the RSPK theory, what this actually means is there is a person who we refer to as an RSPK agent, and they are manifesting this power. They can randomly move objects with their mind. They have no control over it. And this theory is becoming uh, more and more popular in, in scientific circles. Um, a few other possible theories out there. Does everybody know about the Enfield poltergeist or have heard about it? Yep, 1970s, England. Has anybody seen the movie The Conjuring 2? Yep, all right, then you know about the Enfield poltergeist. Uh, difference is one was a real case, one's a, a Hollywood fiction. Um, if you read the book that the investigators actually put together, uh, it's called This House is Haunted, really great book. At the conclusion of that, they actually said it was Tourette's. Uh, part of that was because Tourette's came into the spotlight around the end of that case. Um, there was a lot of journal articles about it. They were reading through those and went, hang on, there's some correlation between cases of Tourette's and what supposed RSPK agent was going through. Um, however, as Tony pointed out, um, correlation and causation are two very different things. Um, a few other very quick one, seismic activity in underground water, so basically vibrations moving through a building, moving the objects. Um, electromagnetism, in this case though, we're looking at it purely from a physics perspective. So there's an electromagnetic field in the area that is causing a metallic object to move. Um, hallucinations, memory lapse, wishful thinking, um, I think a lot of that has been covered off already for us. Um, and the final one is fraud. Now, interestingly, with a lot of cases of poltergeists, uh, fraud tends to come up at some point, particularly because there is so much interest in the poltergeist case. You have uh, the media, you have reporters, you have journalists, you have the general uh, populace wanting to come and have a look at this house with all these objects flying around. When that starts to happen, if people are turning up wanting to see that and it's not happening, fraud tends to come into it. So part of a, an investigation into a poltergeist is trying to discern what is real and what could be fraud. Poltergeist cases tend to also have a lot of children involved. So they always like to be a little bit mischievous and have a bit of fun when the grown-ups aren't looking as well. Um, with this particular case that, um, that I investigated, um, we came to the conclusion of it being an RSPK agent, um, and that tends to be my preferred um, default go-to theory for, for poltergeists. Um, so recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis. Usually after I explain that term to people, um, they're still looking at me with this really sort of bored face of what the hell does that mean? You haven't actually explained it. Um, 
To which point I say, go and watch the movie Carrie. Up until the prom scene, it explains RSPK agents really well. Um, particularly in terms of what her home life was like, her school life was like, what her psychological state was like, um, and what she was able to do up until that point. From the prom scene onwards, um, it's just all Hollywood fantasy from there. But it actually is a really good example of, um, of RSPK. All right, so on to my research, on to my story. Um, this is going to be um, story time, so you can settle down and relax for a bit. Um, so it was July 2012, um, and I was sitting in a little bar here in Sydney. Um, it was early in the afternoon, it was quiet. I was sitting at a table reading a book. Um, there was a table across the room of maybe three or four people. They were having a quiet conversation, um, minding my own business. Suddenly I saw this shadow walk across the other side of the bar. And because I had my book, uh, sorry, I had my head buried in a book, um, I saw it from the corner of my eye. I actually recognized it as one of the people who worked there. So I sort of looked up to say hi. Um, nothing there, completely gone. And okay, you know, I'm seeing things, no worries, happens all the time. Um, went back to my book. Only a few moments later, um, a Venetian mask, very similar to this one, um, flew off a shelf and landed in the middle of the room um, with a really discerning thud. Now, this mask just didn't fall off a shelf due to being you know, not properly balanced or anything like that. It flew off the shelf. Um, so it would have landed probably further from where I'm currently standing from this wall. So there was some force and some trajectory behind it. It actually cleared a table that was directly below the mask. Um, one of the owners of the bar came out, hearing the thud, went, oh, the mask has fallen, again. Okay, so then let's have a chat later on about what I saw just before, before the mask fell. Um, and that's what really kicked this whole thing off. Um, we started talking about potentially that the, the bar was haunted, uh, we started talking about other occurrences that had happened, uh, other objects moving, electrical disturbances, um, doors opening and closing on their own, those types of things. So, from July 2012 through to about June 2013, so about 12 months or so, oh, sorry, um, yeah, 12 months, um, we had doors opening and closing, doors slamming on people. This is a really interesting one, we'll get back to that later on. Um, objects moving, electrical equipment inexplicably not working, electronics being played with, partial apparitions, we'll come back to that one later as well, um, and flickering lights. Now, it's not that each of these things happened once. This is the main list of events that happened multiple times. All right, what happened after June? So from June um, through to August of the same year, uh, so we're talking June, July, August here, only a few months. The amount of stuff that happened in that time period was absolutely nothing. Nothing happened in those three months. We had gone from a 12-month period where we had documented a very large number of occurrences to suddenly everything stopping, like somebody turned off a switch somewhere. There were two events that happened though, I lie. Um, in June, a staff member left. And that's when things stopped. Because of this, we started to then have the discussions around August that perhaps it wasn't a haunting that we were dealing with, but an actual poltergeist. From there, I provided the owners with um, some literature around other poltergeist cases that had happened around the world. They read through that and went, oh my God, this is what we were dealing with. We now have an answer to it. However, at this point, we still only have correlations. We don't have the causation at this point. Um, so I said, okay, let me start investigating this. Let me start properly documenting what happened and see if we can actually determine what has been happening here. So an RSPK agent, these are um, some fairly stereotypical 
uh, traits of an RSPK agent. If you go through the literature, this is the type of thing that you're going to find. Um, audience particip participation time. In terms of age, what age bracket do you think an RSPK agent has to be in? Any thoughts? Young? Teenager? Mm -hmm. um, male or female? Male? Female? Yep. Um, that's there, those two are actually the big myth. Um, so there are a lot of documented cases of male and female RSPK agents. Um, it just seems to be that for some reason, and maybe it's because of Hollywood, people go, oh no, for a poltergeist, for an RSPK agent, it has to be a female. The same goes with age. A lot of people go, it's got to be a teenager, an adolescent, because they're going pu uh, through puberty. It's the hormone change. That's why they're an RSPK agent. Again, it is not true. There are a lot of um, documented cases uh, where RSPK agents have been as young as eight and as old as 70. Okay? So there's still hope for us all. Um, but some other stereotypical qualities. They've usually gone through a traumatic experience, and that can be a number of things. Um, with, the, with that uh, age bracket of adolescence, you know, puberty comes into it, um, you know, bullying and so forth at school and, and all those type of things come into it as well, but there could be problems at home, there could be a, a divorce with the parents, um, it could be a, a, a domestic disputes at home, so any type of traumatic experience. Uh, it could be that a, an adult has lost their, lost their job, gone through a divorce themselves, and that culmination can end up being that traumatic experience. Um, with them, they usually have psychological tension and interpersonal problems of some sort, usually related to the traumatic experience. Again, think about the movie Carrie. Um, unable to release tension. So because of the poor social skills, when something goes wrong, RSPK agents tend not to know how to deal with this. And the RSPK becomes that release valve for them. The tension builds up. The movie Carrie does this really well. You see the tension in her building up. She's arguing with her mother and then suddenly, bang, something happens. And then stuff starts uh, flying around. Our RSPK agent was in a motor vehicle accident very early on into the case. So around the same time that um, all of these problems started to happen. So we believe that may be the traumatic experience for them. Um, from there on, he, the person went through frequent mood swings. Um, they started arguing with the owners and other staff members. Interestingly enough, um, I mentioned doors slamming on people earlier. There was one person in particular that the doors kept slamming on. It was one of the owners of the bar. It was the person it was the owner that this RSPK agent was in frequent conflict with. It was almost as though they were manifesting this RSPK energy to slam the door in that person's face. Um, a physical change of appearance. So when the arguments were happening, the owner would report to me, it was like his face just changed. Yeah, it is not something that we find typical of RSPK cases, um, but something interesting to include in there. Um, this person became rude to customers, started resenting the owners and other staff, resenting the job, not wanting to be there. Um, and then some other really odd behaviours that they hadn't seen before. The person started muttering to themselves and started exhibiting um, OCD type behaviour. So they would be, um, one of the reports was that they would be at the sink, washing their hands, muttering to themselves constantly. And this went on and on and on. Um, so how I went about the research itself, it was broken up into three stages. Um, stage one was a survey. Something to keep in mind with, uh, with the methodology here is the case was kind of over before the investigation started. So the person had left in June 2013, in August 2013, 
that's when we started the investigation and started documenting what was going on. Um, so I surveyed the remaining staff. Uh, so we had about six people there doing the survey. And the questions focused on what, what disturbances had they experienced since June 2013. So roughly the previous 12 or 13 months. That's what the data I was trying to collect. Um, I was also interested in the location of the disturbances as well to see if there were any correlations there. Um, the second stage was a follow-up. So analyzed all the survey responses, did some follow-up interviews, and they were either face-to-face -face or over the phone, just to unpack some of the responses a little bit more, find out a little bit more information. Um, and in the previous talk, there was um, some discussion around EMF fields, electromagnetic fields, and how they can manipulate and play around with, with brain chemistry. So I also did a, went through, did an electromagnetic field sweep of the entire place. Um, part of that was to go back and have a look. Let's say, for example, there were a whole bunch of events happening in the kitchen. And then we found that there was um, a really strong electromagnetic field in that kitchen. Maybe it's not a poltergeist. Maybe it's something else that we need to investigate. So I didn't want to close off the avenues of saying, it's a poltergeist case, let's go for it and find this poltergeist, get the Scooby gang together. It was about what are some of the other possibilities out there as well and staying open-minded to that. Um, Tony mentioned the, um, the God helmet experiments as well, which can be a bit um, controversial at times. Um, and I also wanted to sort of see, is, could there be anything in those, um, in those experiments um, that happened with the God helmet, and can we maybe find some correlations between those experiments and what could be happening in this particular case? Um, the EMF sweep, by the way, turned out to be a real non-event. So there really wasn't anything there to report. Um, so getting into the analysis, into the nitty gritty of this, um, there are two phenomena in parapsychology that, um, that I tend to focus on. Um, one is the survival hypothesis, uh, which looks at hauntings. Um, and this is where I sort of say, to me at least, the term ghost is a bit of a misnomer, because we actually don't really know if ghosts are there. We haven't captured one. We haven't been able to, to dissect one. Um, and then there's poltergeist or RSPK phenomena. So I had to try and determine, at this point, my research was still looking at, is it a haunting or is it a poltergeist? Which of the two? There are two options. Which one is it? Um, so I had to come up with, first of all, some criteria to help me determine that. And I went through a, a range of um, other research that had happened in the past to look at the similarities between all of those poltergeist cases and to determine, is there a set of criteria that parapsychologists can apply to a case to determine if it is a haunting or if it's a poltergeist? So it was one of the first things I needed to do. Um, the, the second set, and we'll talk a little bit more about each of these in a moment, the second thing I did was to categorize the types of disturbances that people had actually reported to me um, into these two different categories, sensed or observable. Uh, particularly with sensed disturbances, this really links in to our previous talk that Tony was doing. So, going to those criteria to determine whether uh, a case is a haunt or a poltergeist. Um, if anyone is looking at becoming a poltergeist in the future, uh, looking for a bit of a career change, you might want to take some of this into mind. Um, so, in my research, I came up with five criteria for a poltergeist. Criteria number one, um, six months. This is the average duration for a poltergeist case. They can go on for years, they can go on much longer, they can be much shorter as well. But the average, when you go through a lot of databases of um, parapsychological organizations across the world, the average is six months. Um, this particular case went on for you know, a little bit over a year. So that's one of the criteria. Um, the next, with poltergeist cases, we have a high number, a large number of objects moving around. 
With hauntings, it's the opposite. With hauntings, you don't have a lot of objects moving around. However, you do have a lot more apparitions, a lot more reports of people seeing something. And this goes back to that sensed and observable uh, disturbances. Um, so it's either a high number of um, objects moving or disturbances to electrical equipment, and these have to be happening on a frequent basis. Okay? You have to have a number of objects moving, let's say, every week or every fortnight for it to be uh, considered a poltergeist case. Um, you can't make any noise. Everybody's heard about um, hauntings where you know, there's moaning and there's chains and there's footsteps going down the corridor at night. Those type of disturbances are associated more with hauntings. With poltergeist cases, um, the majority of the noises that are reported are actually due to physical objects moving. So when that mask flew off the shelf, landed on the floor, made that thud, that was the, they're the types of noises that are being made when objects are actually physically moving. Um, with poltergeist cases, there are very, very few disembodied voices that come out of nowhere, or disembodied sounds, I should say. Um, you can't appear in front of people. You've got to stay in the background if you want to be a poltergeist. So this is going back to the apparitions. There are very few uh, reports of apparitions or actual spirit appearing in front of somebody in a poltergeist case they tend to be associated more with a haunting. Um, and the final one, you've got to be willing to travel. What I mean by this is hauntings are associated with a location. You hear about a haunted building, a haunted town, a ghost town. Um, you might even hear about a haunted object. And in, with a haunting, it's associated with that location or that object. Uh, with poltergeist cases, it's associated with a person, with the RSPK agent. So if you're living with an RSPK agent and you're getting used to the objects flying around, to the beds rattling at night and so forth, um, if that RSPK agent decides to go on holidays for two or three weeks, suddenly everything stops because they are no longer there. And again, this is a, a frequent motif in a lot of poltergeist cases. Um, working in high stress environments, unfortunately, the psychological state for a lot of RSPK agents is not good, and that is what is that's the cause of them being able to to manifest you know, these abilities and the phenomena. Um, so you must be able to work with people who are particularly in a in a high stress environment. Um, also, if you are interested in becoming a poltergeist in the future, um, the pay really sucks. So they're the five criteria. You can also reverse those criteria. Um, they are actually outlined in, in the journal um, in much more detail, and it's not written up as a job description at all. Um, but if you actually reverse each of those criteria, you get a really nice set um, for looking at or determining whether um, a case is a haunt. So the next thing I had to do is look at sensed and um, observable disturbances. So I had a long list of disturbances that are quite common in hauntings and poltergeist cases that are um, associated with any type of paranormal experience, let's say. Um, I wanted to break those down into, into two. From that long list, there are a number of disturbances that are associated with a haunting. Apparitions is a great example. So with a haunting, you have a lot of apparitions. With a poltergeist case, you have very few apparitions. It's not to say that you will have no apparitions, you will have less. Um, by the same token, if you have a, um, a haunting, you will have um, very few objects moving around. With a poltergeist case, the amount of objects being reported as moving is astronomical, really high. Um, and there's a lot of criteria, there's a lot of these other disturbances that are associated with poltergeists and a whole bunch that are associated with hauntings. However, from all the research that I went through, I couldn't actually find a nice clean list of 
these are the types of disturbances associated or frequently seen with um, haunts, and these are the ones frequently seen with poltergeists. So I had to come up with the list myself. Had to go through a whole bunch of research and make that up. Um, so from my list, I had um, sensed disturbances, and these are hallucinatory in nature. So think back to what Tony was talking about earlier. Um, everything that he said applies here. Um, so sensed disturbances are usually experienced only by an individual. So it might be that we're all here, suddenly we all go quiet and we all start listening for, or investigating for ghosts. Um, and I go, did you hear that over there? I heard footsteps. And everyone kind of looks at me weirdly and goes, mm, no, I didn't really hear anything, John. Okay, that's what I'm talking about, a, a sensed um, experience. It may not necessarily be going through my ears. Um, it could be something inside my brain that is triggering and going, I think I heard something over there. Um, with these, we can't measure them and we can't capture them. Okay, if that noise isn't actually a physical noise being made, but it is something that's gone, um, gone awry you know, within, my, uh, within my head, within my brain, we can't record that on an audio recorder. Nobody else can hear it. It's purely only something that I can interact with. Um, observable disturbances, though, are much more objective. Suddenly, if that paper cup flew off that table and landed four metres away, everybody saw that. If you didn't actually see it fly, you can still see the results of it. The cup is now sitting in the corner of the room. Um, so observed ones, much more objective, can be shared by many, many people, um, and they can be measured or recorded. So the camera could capture, capture that cup moving across the room. Um, we could measure the distance and so forth. Something else. Um, I started off with a joke in saying that, you know, with a lot of presentations, um, you know, we've all got to start off with the joke, so we've, done, we've ticked that box. Um, the other thing that I find quite common, particularly with, um, with academic presentations, um, is you get the, these professors who uh, have a really great graph and they just shrink it down so it's really tiny, so no one can see it. Um, they don't really explain what it's about and then they just assume that everybody knows that it's digested the information um, and then we move on. So we've done that. <laughs> everybody understands that completely. Fantastic. Let's move on. Um, here's the same graph um, in, a, in a much more readable format. Um, I do appreciate that the text over here may not be completely readable for everyone. Um, but this is the list of disturbances that got sent out as part of that survey. And people were asked to record, how many times did you experience each of these things and where did you experience it? Um, once I had that, I was able to collate it. Pardon me. Um, in the first column here, so all of these, um, these first set of disturbances up here, the ones with red, um, these are our sensed ones. So these are the type of disturbances that we would more commonly associate with a haunting. Uh, down the bottom, the blue ones, these are our observable ones, the ones that we tend to associate more with a poltergeist. The ones in the middle, the green ones, they're sitting right in the middle there. Sometimes they show up quite commonly in poltergeist cases, Sometimes they're showing up quite commonly in hauntings as well. Um, so from this, we're able to sort of total um, the amount of observable disturbances that we would associate with a poltergeist, 71 versus um, 59%. So you might look at this straight away and go, well, that proves that there was a poltergeist over a haunting because this number is bigger and this number is smaller. But that's not the case. That's not the case. Um, what I then was able to do is go through and use something called a t-test. So if you think about the, the survey I did at the very beginning of this presentation where you had to put your hands up, um, and we had the data set in that big, really complex formula that made it look like I just thumped the keyboard and said, that's science, um, that was actually a t-test. And what a t-test can do is actually tell us is some, if something is statistically significant or not. So the difference between these two numbers is not actually statistically significant. 
So this alone doesn't actually prove that there was a poltergeist involved, a poltergeist or a haunting. It hasn't allowed us to determine uh, which type of phenomena was being experienced here. Stage three was the second survey that I ran. So we had survey one, covered a 12 month period. I then went away and did the data analysis. Presented those findings to, um, to the owners of the bar. They said, that's great, that's fantastic. Tell us more. Did a second survey, and in order to compare survey one and survey two, they had to be, there had to be some constants involved. So the time frame was still 12 months. I wanted to keep those two time frames the same. Um, sample size was six, however I will say that um, by the time this survey was run, some people had left and some new people had started. Um, very similar survey questions. Um, the only differences were that the list of disturbances had been expanded. So I'd found um, a whole bunch of other new research that went, hey, I should maybe include some of these other disturbances in here. Um, and I also asked people to talk about any notice, noticeable changes that they had found in the location. Remember how I said it'd been like a switch had gone? Um, when that RS, suspected RSPK agent left, um, the mood lifted in the place. And customers, staff, myself, we were all saying, hey, this place is really different. It feels lighter. The mood, the energy of the place is completely different. Um, so I asked questions around that, so some, um, some qualitative questions there too. So this is the results from survey two. Um, the list is a little bit longer, and that's why it's, it's a lot harder to read in this scale. But the interesting part of it is, is this. Um, there's been a huge drop in the amount of observable disturbances, those types of disturbances that we associate with, with poltergeist cases. That plummeted. And remember, survey one and two were both covering a 12-month period. If there was no paranormal activity involved, and all of these disturbances were, were explainable, or they were just randomly happening, um, if that was the case, we would expect that these two numbers here would pretty much be the same in survey two as they were to survey one. So we can tell that something has changed in that period. Maybe it was that RSPK agent leaving, maybe it wasn't. But we're starting to actually be able to, we're going deeper down the, the, the rabbit hole and able to draw some of those conclusions in a bit more meaningful way. Um, using t-tests, again, I was actually able to find that this drop from the previous number, which was about 71, was actually statistically significant. So that means, hey, there was actually something potentially causing these disturbances. Um, the number of sensed disturbances actually remained fairly consistent. There is a little bit of a drop, not a huge amount. So, um, what changed? And I've pre um, pretty much explained most of this in the previous slide. So, significant, statistic, statistically significant decrease in the amount of um, of observable phenomena and a statistically significant increase in sensed phenomena. And that we can draw that conclusion based upon the t-test and there's another example of one. And that's actually one of the ones that was used in this research. Um, so, my conclusion of what the case was actually about um, was that it was a poltergeist phenomena that we were dealing with. However, it actually merged, it actually morphed, I should say, into, um, into a haunt phenomena. Uh, the reason why I think this happened is because the amount of um, observable disturbances dropped, um, there was still a large amount of, of um, sensed disturbances happening as well. And one of the theories that I still have is that there was an RSPK agent involved and the disturbances did stop when that person left. However, that particular person was going through something that we now refer to as spiritual emergency. Um, spiritual emergency is now something that the medical profession is starting to understand and acknowledge, which is fantastic. Um, spiritual emergency is quite wide and diverse, 
But one of the things um, that it actually acknowledges is that when people, um, this might sort of, um, in a much more casual sense, be referred to as somebody opening up psychically. But when people do that, um, a lot of, of bizarre phenomena actually start occurring around them. So what I actually believe is that this RSPK agent was going through spiritual emergency and that was part of what the trauma they were going through at that particular time. When that happens, it's almost like um, a beacon, I think, goes off um, and a bunch of other spirits start coming and gathering around you. And that's why you sort of hear reports uh, of people who are opening up and suddenly they're seeing spirits and they're communicating with spirits and lots happening. Um, so that was one of the conclusions that I came to with that particular case. Um, so a couple of takeaways. Um, a lot of poltergeist cases unfortunately get overlooked because a lot of people go, wow, we've got a ghost, we've got a haunted house, let's investigate that. And they're not necessarily open to the idea of, well, maybe it's something else. Maybe it is a, um, a, a poltergeist going on, or maybe it is something simple and explainable like electromagnetic fields. Um, so keep your minds open as to what the cause, what the phenomena that you're dealing with actually is. Um, in terms of furthering this research and furthering the field, um, that list, that criteria of haunting, um, so the, sorry, the five criteria you can use to determine if something is a poltergeist or a haunting, um, I would really like to see that being used um, much more commonly as well. Um, but also that list of sensed and observed disturbances that I came up with, um, that was something that was really hard to come up with. It had involved a lot of research. It wasn't something that somebody else had put together themselves and had been tried and tested um, through, through years of academic rigour. Um, so that needs to be refined and expanded and really nailed down. And I think if that happens, that might actually be a really great resource that researchers could use to say, hey, we do have a poltergeist here or we are dealing with haunt phenomena here. Um, and I think with a lot of the research that, that Tony was doing as well, um, in terms of hallucinatory, hallucinatory um, experiences, that really helps to define that list um, and the criteria for it and the definitions um, and really helps to nail that down. Thank you, everyone.